choirs making their way down, I want to tell you a story. It's a true story. It happened to me. It was when I was in seminary. It was in my, the end of my second year. And I had an issue. It was a medical issue. It wasn't really too serious. Uh, I, just, I, I started getting a little pressure up here on my gum, kind of on my tooth. I wasn't sure what was going on. It didn't hurt. It was just a little bit of pressure. And it built over the course of a few weeks. It built and built and built. And finally, I looked one day, and I had a little blister on my gum. And I thought, what's going on? So I let, just let it stay. I thought, maybe it'll go away. And that's what guys do. It'll go away. Well, it didn't. It continued on and on. And, and finally, it got to the point where I did what every guy would do. I went and sterilized the needle. Yeah. I drained that sucker. Now, that sounds gross, doesn't it? But I did. And it went away for a while. And after a couple of weeks, the pressure, the blister. I did this cycle three, four, five times. I finally decided maybe I should go see a professional about this. So I went to the dentist, and uh, he looked. He did these x-rays, and he said, I'm going to send you to an endodontist. I don't know what that is. Sure, I'll go. Went to the endodontist. He took his x-rays, poked part of it around. He said, you need an apicoectomy. An apicoectomy? What is that? Well, that's what an apicoectomy is. I, had no, I knew ectomy meant something was going to be cut and removed from my body. And I wasn't sure what my apico was, but I was going to have it removed. Anyway, he said, here's what's going to happen. He said, you won't feel a thing. It'll be fine. Yeah, you, have you ever heard that at the dentist before? You won't feel a thing. They were going to say, we're going to numb you up real well. Um, and here's what we're going to do. We, we slice the gum fold it back, take out all the um, infection, clip the root of the tooth off, pack it full of medicine, flap it back, sew it up. I thought, wow, that just sounds wonderful. I can't wait. Sign me up. So I thought, well, I might as well do it. So I did, and I happened to have that procedure done on my, I think it was my 36th birthday, nice birthday present to me, have an epicoectomy. But here's the deal. When I was taking care of that issue on my own, I was taking care of a surface issue. I had a, an issue on the surface, my, my gum, the little blister. I was taking care of that surface issue with a surface problem. I mean, I'm sorry, taking care of the surface problem with a surface solution. The thing is, it kept reoccurring. I had to actually get to the root, and literally, here, we're talking about the root of the tooth, get to the root of the issue to get it resolved. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, is getting to the root of the problem. Now, initially, I knew I was going to be a little more uncomfortable. It was going to cost a lot. You know, I was going to be out of commission for a couple of days. But you know, that pain, even though I didn't feel anything, that pain in the, you know, initially was going to be offset by me having better dental health. So anyway, that, I guess that has happened. Now, here's the deal. I did have a choice. I didn't have to have that procedure done. I could have continued with the uh, topical um, fix, the short-term fix, and I would probably be doing that even today if I still had that tooth left. You know, who knows? So as, as we think about surface problems, surface problems in our country, uh, you know, several things come to my mind. I think about crime. Um, you probably read this week in the newspaper about Pine Bluff being the second worst city to live in, right behind what? Detroit. Uh, you know, that's something we should be proud of, right? Second worst city to live in. You have you know, all these other problems, violence, disrespect, and I'm talking you know, just disrespect for people, disrespect for life, those kind of things. Uh, profanity. We have shows on TV now that the titles are things we, didn't, we couldn't say. You, know, you have all those kind of issues going on. Um, people living beyond their means, living not just paycheck to paycheck, but spending more than they make. How do we fix that? Uh, we have alcohol, drug abuse, food abuse, all these different issues the problem is we try to attack those and solve those with surface solutions. And when we do that, the problem keeps reoccurring. We need to get to the root of the issue, see what that is, and deal with that. Now, I went back and looked at some statistics uh, back at my, starting with my birth year, 1961, and um, I know you're going to find this, really, you're going to find this surprising. Per capita murder in the United States has stayed fairly constant kind of goes up and down, up and down. Now, in Jefferson County, I'm sure that's a different story, but across the nation, it's pretty constant. Everything else, though, robbery and rape and aggravated assault, all these other crimes have skyrocketed. 
well, how have we tried to attack those issues? We look on one side, we look at the prevention side. We've, we've said, tell our kids, don't, or just say no to drugs. That's a good thing to do. And, and we, we try to uh, secure our homes, have security systems, we try to be more alert when we're out, and those kind of things. We have prevention. On the other side, when the criminal's been caught and he's in jail, we try the rehabilitation part, where hopefully when he gets out, uh, he won't go back to that life of crime. He has a new trade or whatever. And then right in the middle, we, we've tried tougher penalties. We've tried the three strikes law, you know, and all these different things. But the problem is those are surface solutions to surface problems. And like, I, like we've seen, we, we try those solutions, and the numbers, the, the crime keeps going up. Now, I must say that, that doing these things, teaching your kids to say no to drugs, that, those are good things to do. These are all good things, but it's not the solution. Here's a little equation for you. Trying to correct a surface problem with a surface solution results in a resurfacing or a recurrence of that problem. It was true with my gum. It's true with crime. It's true with sin in our lives as well. And that's what we're going to be looking at today is when we have that sin in our life that we try to, uh, to, um, to attack, to, uh, to, to solve in a surface manner, it just keeps coming back. So uh, that's kind of where we're headed today. We're going to be in the book of 1 John. That's toward the back of your Bible, back toward Revelation, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation, right back there at the back. Uh, we're going to be looking there in chapter 2 here in a minute. Now we know that 1 John was written by the Apostle John, not John the Baptist. Those are two separate people. And one of the common themes in this book is fellowship with God. And when we have sin in our life, that fellowship gets broken. And we can't continue in that fellowship. And we have to get to the root of what's going on before we can uh, restore that fellowship. So that's what we're going to be looking at. John gives us um, three, what I see, root issues, root uh, sins. And we're going to look at those in, in depth. And then I'm going to say that we can even boil those down to one major sin, one root issue that we need to deal with. So let's look at that. We're in 1 John chapter 2. Uh, verses 15 and 16. It says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Next screen. For everything in the world, uh, and then he has a little parenthetical statement here. We're going to look at th this is where we're going to look in detail. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Well, we're going to dissect this a little bit because um, we look at this statement, don't love the world or anything in the world. And um, we, we could interpret that a number of ways because I think of some of the things that are in the world. And I think of ice cream and the Razorbacks and my job and my wife. Okay, we've got all these things in the world. Am I not supposed to love these things? Okay, is that what the Bible's telling me? Because that kind of goes against John 3.16, doesn't it? For God so loved the world, he loved the world. What is this? I'm confused. What does this mean? Well, we know, uh, as we look at this verse, that that, uh, that love is, is that Greek word agapao. Okay, that, that its noun equivalent is agape. We're, most of us are kind of familiar with that. That's that God-like, self-sacrificing love. Well, I can take myself out of that for ice cream. I'm not self-sacrificial for ice cream. I think Brandon is, but I'm not. And... Um, my job, usually not. I'll sacrifice sometimes, but not, sa you know, not all the time. And uh, Razorbacks, no. not sa But what about my wife? You know, I, I thought I'm told to be self-sacrificial uh, for my wife. Um, so let, let's, let's look at that phrase, the world, because that's a, a common phrase that Bible writers use to describe something. And so we're going to look at just a few of the verses that are in the, especially the New Testament, that describe what the world is. Let's look at first at John 15. Verses 18 and 19 says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Okay, so you've got the world, the world, the world here being used by, by, uh, by John there. Then we look at James chapter 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. We've got James writing that as well. Then Paul also, 1 Corinthians 2, 12. What, 
we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. So as, as we look at these verses, and then also we look at 1 John that, that, uh, that we're in today, we see that when Bible writers, a lot of times when they say the world, they're comparing that against God. So you've got God's ways, and you've got the ways of the world. So it's, it's, it's what's in opposition to God. You've got heavenly ways, earthly ways. You've got things of God, things of the world. So that's what we're talking about here. When I love things that are of the world so much, that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about items in the world. He's talking about when I love things that are, are of a sinful nature. Okay, that's where we're getting to here. Now, um, John goes on further. He defines that root problem or the root issues when it comes to loving the world here uh, in, in verse 16. He says, everything in the world, and then we have this statement, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. I'm going to, I'm going to put before you here that I think every sin can be categorized in one of those three areas. Everything in the world, one of those three things. And then we're going to look later, and I think those can be boiled down to one major uh, sin as we look at that. So let's look here at, at uh, something you don't hear a lot in church. Let's look at lust for a while. Because um, we have two of them here. We have lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes. What do we mean here? When we think of lust, primarily what comes to mind is sexual. And Jesus certainly used that terminology, didn't he? When he said, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say to you, when you look at someone, you look at a woman with lustful thoughts, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So there's that side of it. There's also another side to lust that we're going to look at as well, and that is, uh, we, we use the phrase, a lust for power. Okay, meaning I really, really want that power. So just broadly defining lust, uh, it's, it's an overwhelming, selfish, strong desire that's disproportionate to a natural desire. See, God has made us sexual beings, but when we distort that, it becomes lust. He's given us a, a desire to improve and do better, but when we take that out of proportion, and, and if it's all about me, that's, that's wrong as well. So, let's look at these three uh, individually here. The first one he mentions is lust of the flesh. That's the, the, the um, what appeals to my flesh, what appeals to, what makes my body feel good, okay? So I'm looking at, um, we're looking at different ways that manifests itself. The appetites, mainly sexual, food, drugs, alcohol, all these things that, that make me feel better, make my body feel good. Different avenues that this takes is uh, uh, improper relationships. If I uh, have a, uh, it can, it can start off innocently, but I can have an emotional affair that might turn into something else with, a, with another woman uh, because she makes me feel good about myself. Okay, when, when, when we start that, that's, of course, lust of the flesh. Um, uh, pornography, food, drug, alcohol, all those kind of abuse, that's all categorized in lust of the flesh. If we get down then to lust of the eyes, that would include anything you can see, coveting stuff, uh, being um, the success, power, those kind of things that, that I want to grab onto, okay? You've got lust of the eyes. And then pride of life, those are the things that make you, that you want to feel more important about yourself than is necessary, like the self-promotion, the haughty spirit, the making yourself as God, making yourself all that when you're really not. Um, seeking knowledge, not, not just to be smarter, but to be smarter than others so you can put others down, all those kind of things. That's all categorized in the pride of life. So, if I love things or power or pleasure more than I love God, there's a word for that. It's, it's, it's an Old Testament word, but it's also, we use it quite a lot in the New Testament as well. When, 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 I, when there's something between me and God, or I've put something before God, what's that word? It's idolatry, or, or an idol, that's right. And you might think, now wait a minute, telling a lie, that's an idol, or even, even this little secret sin I have, that's an idol. That, that's kind of a, that's a big jump, Jim. It's a pretty big jump. There again, let's look at some verses that, uh, in the New Testament that, that talk about this. Let's look at Colossians 3, 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. 
And there's the things of the world, the earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Such person is what? Read it. Such person is what? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I've, ah, go back. Okay, go back to the first one. I'm sorry. That's our first one, isn't it? Yes. Okay, all those things is what? Idolatry. That's idolatry. Those are the things we've been talking about. Sexual immorality, evil desires, lust, greed, all those things. All those things, Paul says in Colossians, are idolatry. So I'm not just making this up. This is out of the Bible. Let's look at the next one, Ephesians. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person. Those are the things we've been talking about, the things of earth. Such a person is what? An idolater. Oh, my goodness. So these sins can be categorized as, uh, as, uh, as being idolatry. Let's look at this chart. Uh, I think this will help us kind of put this together a little bit more. We see we have some surface problems that exist in our society. We've got, and I, I've abbreviated these, you know, so we can fit them into the chart, but, you know, l the sexual immorality and the, the, the drug, the food, the alcohol abuse, all those kind of things categorized in the lust of the flesh. The next three, the red things, all under lust of the eyes, the orange things, all making myself as God so concerned about how others see me, you know, putting on that false front, all that pride of life, all three of those boil down to idolatry. That's, uh, that's pretty strong, isn't it? Um, there's a reason God feels so strongly about idolatry, because it's, it's, at the root of our, it's at the root of our sin nature. In fact, the first two commandments deal with that. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't have any graven images. So, you know, see, God demands. He doesn't suggest, but he demands fidelity in our relationship with him. He doesn't want this open dating, open marriage kind of thing. He demands uh, him to be the main, the part of, his, uh, of your life. Let me give you an example. I showed you this picture last year. This week, on Wednesday... Ruth will have suffered for 31 long, long years. That was back in my, that was about 50 pounds ago for me. Um, but at the heart of our marriage, and by, by no means is perfect, but at the heart of our marriage is a commitment to God and fidelity to each other. Let's say you saw me out with another woman, and we're at an elegant, the most elegant romantic restaurant in Whitehall, which is Popeye's. So, so we're there, we're sitting on the same side of the booth, you know, we're all lovey-dovey and all this stuff, and you walk in, you're going to be appalled at that, right? Because number one, I'm one of your ministers, number two, you're a married guy, what are you doing? Okay, so you got that going on, that, that, that's just not right. Now, let's just take that farce and stretch it out a little bit farther, and I go home that night, and Ruth's waiting for me, can you imagine her saying, well, honey, how was your date tonight? I hope you had a great time. No, that will not happen. Let me just say, it will not happen. That scenario is not going to happen, but that uh, definitely wouldn't happen. Why is that? Because she'd be angry. She would be hurt, uh, heartbroken, because she's jealous. Not in a lifetime movie, petty, controlling kind of way, but in the way that God is jealous for us. In fact, that's one of the adjectives that's used for God's love for us, is that he is a jealous God. He demands that fidelity and that love uh, from him or to him. So, if you treat God's sacrifice to have that relationship, which is Jesus' death, if you treat that lightly and have that idolatry of sin in your life, don't expect blessings and um, fellowship just like I won't expect Ruth to welcome me with open arms when I come home from the date. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Now, do you realize that Satan has been using these three root issues to tempt people throughout time? We go back to Genesis, and let's look at Eve. As she was tempted, and she saw that, the, that that fruit was good for food. That's kind of a food thing. That's a lust of the flesh. She saw it was pleasing to the eye. Well, I'd like to have that. That's a lust of the eyes. And it was also, remember what Satan told her? It, you, it'll open your eyes. You'll become like God. 
there's that desire to, uh, uh, go, go back, I'm still on Eve, there we go. Um, there's that desire to, to, to gain that wisdom, to be like God. That's the pride of life. All those three things root back to the original tempter, which is Satan. Now we go to Jesus. Here we go. All right. He was tempted as well by Satan. Satan said, hey, you're hungry. It's been 40 days since you've eaten. Turn these stones into bread. Appealing to that, the, that natural appetite, the lust of the flesh. Uh, he said, uh, bow down and worship me. Everything you see, all the kingdoms of the world will be yours. That was the lust of the eyes right there. How about the other temptation? Throw yourself off the temple. And when you do, you'll, you'll do this little magic trick, right? You'll save yourselves or angels will come and save you or whatever. You'll show them who you really are. You'll show people that you're the Messiah. There's that pride of life there too. Satan's been using this same tactic forever because it works. That's, that's where he tempts us is in our uh, weakest points. So whatever you have in your life that's keeping your relationship from God, from being what it should be, it boils down to an idol. When I say I've got this sin in my life and I want to do this more than I want to be with, you know, more than I want to worship God, that's an idol. And God hates idols. On Sunday nights in September, we're going to be looking at idols in uh, in more detail. We're going to be on. Sunday nights for our adults here. We're going to be doing this study by Kyle Eidelman. If you remember, he did the uh, Not a Fan series that we did last year. It's Gods at War. And look at the subtitle, Defeating the Idols that Battle for Your Heart. We're going to go into more detail on Sunday night about each of these idols and how, how, we, can, how we can overcome that. All right, so we've got idols in our life. What in the world do we do? What do we do now? What do we do with this? Well, let's look at a couple of scriptures that will help us out with that. Go back to the Colossians 3, verses 5 through 10. We've got a couple of screens of this here. It says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. We've read a little bit, a little bit of this before. Let me stop right there and say, do you remember in the Old Testament when Israel would take over a land that was uh, possessed by people who worshipped idols, or maybe Israel took in some idols of their own and started worshipping when they kind of get revived and cleanse themselves, what would they do? They'd go in and smash those idols. They would put those idols to death, so to speak. So that's what we're looking at here. Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. So we, get that we need to put to death those things. That, and that might be difficult for us to do. But I think that Jesus helps us out even more here if we go to Matthew 6. Uh, we have four screens of this. This is a little lengthy. It's a, it's a very common passage here, the Sermon on the Mount. And at the very end, he gets to the crux of it. He says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, about your body. What you're going to wear is life, not more than, is life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all this splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? And then we get to the crux of it here. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need him. Here's the key. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What I think Jesus is saying here is that don't pursue stuff. Don't pursue clothing and the stuff that you see, pursue God, pursue his righteousness, pursue him and relationship and his holiness, and when you do, you pursue him, 
and your will lines up under his will, your desires are going to be changed. He's going to meet those as opposed to what we think we need. So, um, and your, your perspective on all those things, on, on relationships, on sex, on food, on power, all those things change when you're lined up with God's will. So today, the choice is yours. Just like I had the choice to have that apicoectomy or to keep doing the needle process, you have a choice. Do you give up the aisle or do you hang on to it? And so my uh, several questions here for you today. Are you going to worship the bass boat in the outdoors or are you going to worship God? Are you going to worship your job or God? And these aren't necessarily bad things, just what is between you and God. Are you going to worship pleasure or God? Sex or God? Stuff, yourself, your desires. I dare say we have some youth who worship their youth group more than they worship God. They enjoy the camaraderie and the getting together and the singing more than they enjoy God. And I would say the same with adults. There are adults that enjoy maybe their Sunday school class or the camaraderie that we have as a church more than the relationship with God. So we've got to look at those things as well. Our spouse, kids, grandkids, family, whatever. Sports. Do we worship sports or do we worship God? All these are, are not bad things. Uh, and, and, and sport, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that people can spend time and money and energy and cart their kids all over the state and nation uh, doing sports, which is fine. But when it comes to church and godly things, whew, I just don't have any energy or time for that. Where's our priorities? What's the idol in our life? It's not bad. We just have to have it in the right perspective. So what's it going to be? Is it going to be the idol created in your own image or God, the creator of all things, who, who loves you and has created you in his own image? And like I said, with my dental treatment, I had a choice, you had a choice. So you're, 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 where you're at today is, do I hang on to that if that's an issue with you? Or do I let that go and worship God? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we do love you very much, and we thank you, Lord, that you have given your life uh, to redeem us, to save us from an eternity separated from you in hell. And I know, Lord, that is something that we take for granted, and we sometimes think that uh, when we have these secret sins or things that we want to hold on to, that um, you just kind of wink and nod and, and everything will be okay. But it's just like the uh, story I told about, uh, about my wife and that... Uh, that's not the case, that you do not like that, and that there's a breaking of fellowship there. And so if that's the case with any of us today, Lord, I pray that you would uh, give us the boldness, the courage to, to let go of that, to forsake that, to smash that idol, to, to, put that, to put those earthly things to death, and to follow you. Because I know that's what you desire. You want us. You want all of us, not just a part, not just 90%. You want all of us. And in a group this size, Lord, there may be someone here who's never completely trusted in you at all. And we pray, Lord, you'd give them courage to, to make that stand, to, to, to make that decision today as well. Lord, we do love you. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to do what's right. We love you, Jesus, and pray these things in your name. Amen. So as we stand, as we sing, we have an opportunity to respond to the message today. I pray that you would do that.